it is with great pleasure that I will introduce my friend Jason Glinos, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Essex, the Department of Government at the Ideology and Discourse Analysis Program, uh, which is, as you may know, the most important program associated with the Essex School of Discourse Analysis. And uh, um, we are all waiting to hear his paper on critical nodal analysis, logics in policy and practice. Jason. Thank you very much, Yanis, uh, uh, and thank you very much to the, uh, the uh, whole uh, project and the program. Uh, Thomas and Yorgos and Nikos and Alexander, so I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm missing a few people, and Joanna, of course, who is uh, also quite instrumental in getting us over here. Um, what I, uh, Yanis, when he invited me, uh, suggested that I might um, uh, say something about uh, the logics approach, uh, uh, which uh, in a sense is um, inspired, as the name implies, by the work of Laclau and Mouffe. And uh, the term logics there is uh, particularly important. The idea of uh, logics appears in the form of social logics and political logics in uh, uh, Ernesto's work and in Chantal's work. And the idea is to take that, although it's not uh, addressed in a very systematic way, and to do that as under-laborers, let's say, of uh, uh, that particular perspective. So what, I've, what I'm suggesting uh, I do today is um, develop in uh, broad brushstrokes the content of this approach that we're calling the logics approach. Um, and one way of thinking about it is to contextualize it in relation to this problem about how to incorporate insights from post-structuralism and psychoanalysis into the critical analysis of social and political practices, as well as policy trends and transformation. So the, the logics approach is one way of seeing this, or addressing this type of problem. And uh, uh, the uh, idea and the approach of logics and what I'm calling the nodal framework, and I'll see if I've got time to cover a bit of that, really emerges in a co-evolutionary way through a set of research projects I'm engaged with, with some colleagues working in finance, health, and education. Uh, I've got some uh, of the references there for those who might be interested. Uh, but what I'm decided to do is, in, in order to sort of uh, draw out the implications of the logics approach, I decided I would run it through a particular example, or rather a particular illustration. And I'm going to use the financial crisis, its response, responses to the financial crisis in the UK, and also the policy reform process as an illustration. Um, so what I'm going to do, really, is start off by looking at the logics approach in in a broad way, and then draw out some of the uh, uh, features in relation to the financial crisis using the work of Irvin Goffman, which we found actually to be really quite useful as a narrative device in situating and placing the different logics that I'm going to be articulating now. Um, good. So one way of starting this is to begin with the sorts of questions that were most familiar with when we think about the financial crisis. Is it usually pitched in terms of causes? So, so, what caused the crisis, the financial crisis, and how do we fix it? So we have here Mervyn King. The price of this financial crisis, the head of uh, Bank of England, by the way, uh, the price of this financial crisis is being borne by people who absolutely did not cause it. But there are different ways of approaching the question of the financial crisis and our responses to it. And there are types of narrative questions that can emerge. So one question might be, well, how do we talk about the financial crisis? How do we talk about responses to the financial crisis? Which leads also to a more critical type of question. This is how we should be talking about the financial crisis. <clears throat> And uh, it's interesting to see how, this is a way of problematizing the financial crisis, how Mervyn King himself is surprised that the degree of public anger has not been greater than it has. 
So this generates a possible question. I'd like to say a research question. So why and how do grievances fail to prompt the kind of reform that the scale of the financial crisis appears to demand? This is not an uncommon type of formulation, but it will serve as a, a neat illustration, I think. Uh, why and how have we failed to talk or respond differently to the crisis? And this calls for a, a kind of a cognitive map, a kind of explanatory narrative, which I'm going to try and develop as a function of logics in the, with the help of uh, Irvin Goffman. So as I said, uh, what, so I'm going to start off by saying something broad about the logics approach and then uh, bring in Goffman in relation to the financial crisis. So in looking at the logics approach, uh, the, the, in a sense it's a response to a set of issues and a set of criticisms um, targeting uh, the Essex school, let's say. Sometimes they're called normative deficit. Where is the critical component associated with the Essex school? There's also the methodological component, or the methodological deficit, let's say. So the logics approach can be under understood as a kind of response to that, an elaboration of some of the concepts which generates a framework and a conceptual framework with which to engage in a, 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 a critical empirical research, inspired very much by the work of Laclau uh, and MOVE. And central to that is a particular ontology. This is the so-called post-structuralist ontology. One key component of this post-structuralist ontology is the horizon of meaning. So the centrality that we attribute to practices of meaning. So in understanding our practices, the role of meaning, the role of the self-interpretations of the actors engaged in the practices is absolutely central in attributing a certain identity and a certain coherence to those practices themselves. As one, it's a starting point, meaning as a horizon. And this is the idea of the concept of discourse, which is central to the concept of discourse the centrality of meaning. But, in addition to that, there is the post bit of post-structuralism, which seeks to emphasize the limits also to uh, discourse and the limits to meaning. And there are many different names associated with that. As we talk about, certainly in the Derridian tradition, the idea of undecidability, and certainly another tradition where the Essex will certainly finds inspiration. The Lacanian tradition is the lack in the other. But there are many different names that can be attributed to this limit of discourse. And very often it gets cashed out in terms of this idea of radical contingency. So radical contingency becomes a, almost an axiom within the context of uh, post-structuralism. So a lot depends then on how that gets translated this idea, this axiom of radical contingency of social relations into a set of concepts that can facilitate uh, critical empirical research. So part of the motivation is then to relate this ontology, this particular structuralist ontology, to a set of debates in the philosophy of social science. So these debates revolve around questions of explanation, understanding, causality, structure and agency, and so on. Engaging also with a set of traditions that are distinct from the post-structuralist tradition. So traditions like hermeneutics, traditions like critical realism or neo-positivism, and that's certainly key reference points in trying to situate the post-structuralist tradition in relation to these debates. And one way of thinking about logics is precisely as a, an explanatory unit that can be seen in contrast to other possible explanatory units. For example, one can think of interpretations within the hermeneutical tradition. So logics becomes distinctive insofar as one can draw a contrast between logics on the one hand and interpretations or self-interpretations or contextualized self-interpretations on the other hand that belongs to the tradition of hermeneutics, but it can also be seen as distinct in relation to another explanatory unit which comes from 
uh, uh, neo-positivism, John, El John Elster's work, or certainly Roy Baskar's and Critical Realism, the idea of a mechanism, or a, 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 certainly a causal mechanism. So one way of thinking about it is to say, actually, what's at stake here is joining forces, the post-structuralist tradition, with these other traditions, in opposing a particular hegemonic, let's say, approach to seeing social science research, in which the dominant explanatory unit gets cashed out in terms of, say, causal laws. So what post-structuralism shares with hermeneutics and with critical realism and certain forms of neo-positivism is this opposition to a certain positivist tradition in which the causal law forms a key part of the explanatory process. Nevertheless, there are still distinctions to be made between this post-structuralist approach and the hermeneutical and the uh, critical realist, and that can be cashed out in the following terms. One can say that what they share is this privileging of meaning and the self-interpretations of the actors engaged in a practice. But what they share as well is that our explanations and our understandings of those practices cannot remain at the level of the self-interpretations of the actors themselves. So our explanations and our understandings are not reducible to the self-understandings of the actors. So the key question then becomes, well, what is it beyond those self-interpretations that constitute these uh, practices, that partly constitute these practices, uh, that we must appeal to in providing a fuller explanation? And so these the logics, the idea of a logic in this post-structuralist tradition is one answer to that question. What beyond the self-interpretations, the contextualized self-interpretations uh, do we, or the self-interpretations do we give? We give logics. In the critical realist tradition, there is the idea of mechanisms. And within the hermeneutical tradition, we have the idea of interpretation. So these are three ways of thinking about or situating, let's say, the uh, post-structuralist uh, tradition. And then the idea would then be to try and draw out some of these, the, some of the implications of these differences uh, for research strategy. And that's what I, uh, I'm hoping that we may be able to discuss perhaps later in, in thinking about the project, the populismist project. So the kinds of research strategy. So how does this translate into questions of uh, uh, interpret interpreting texts, doing interviews, uh, focus groups, things like that that are, are, are quite uh, central. Um, so in a way, what I'm going to do is focus very much there. There's these uh, basic elements of the logics approach, which involve uh, this is drawing on Foucault again, is this idea of problematization. Take st the starting point is the, the, the central problem animating the research itself, which is addressed by appealing to a set of explanatory units here, cashed out in terms of logics, and that's effectively what I'm going to be focusing on. But there are several other elements which I think are central in understanding the whole process of explanation within this post-structuralist tradition. The notion of articulation, which I'm sure people are familiar with, again, drawing on Laclau and Mouffe. The place of critique, which I'm, I'm going to be talking a bit about that, um, and uh, retroduction is a particular mode uh, of explanation that is distinct from induction and deduction. Again, I'm not going to say anything about that. I'm just going to move directly to the idea of logics. So one way of thinking about logics is a thin, it's a thin way of operationalizing this post-structuralist ontology for purposes of critical empirical research. Um, and so it, it pro provides us with a language with which to characterize and pr critically explain the dialectical movement that govern practices, including the way they become instituted, maintained, defended, or transformed. And just to be comprehensive here, what am I, what am I thinking of in terms of a practice? All I want to, and we can discuss this uh, also uh, later, but uh, all I'm trying to capture, all that we try to capture in the, with the notion of a practice, is this idea of a network of activities or intersubjective relations that is sufficiently individuated to allow us to talk about it meaningfully 
and that thus appears to cohere around a set of norms or other conditions of existence. So this idea of relative autonomy, let's say, or our ability to identify something as relatively uh, autonomous in identifying a practice as such. Okay. So, broadly speaking, at a fairly abstract level, this idea of logics tries to capture something about the norms the roles, narratives, as well as the ontological presuppositions that together render a practice or regime possible, intelligible, and or vulnerable. So there's these uh, particular logics that I mentioned earlier on, social logics and political logics, drawing from uh, Laclau and Mouffe. So, in a first approach, we could say that the social logics are trying to capture something at the synchronic level. And the political logics are trying to capture something about the diachronic. So, social logics are aiming at relatively stable patterns in practices and the subject self-interpretations, those engaged in the practices themselves. As a shorthand, one can think of social logics like norms. They're just norms or rules that govern that behavior. But it's not just the rules. It's also passed through the sieve of the self-interpretations of the actors themselves. So we can think of logics of competition as one example of a social logic. We name social logics of competition, certainly within the context of, uh, as we've experienced in universities in the UK. So what does that mean? Well, it means that there is a set of, or a pattern of behavior and engagement that means that I see myself as a competitor with others. But it's not just me as a staff member, for instance, that can see myself as a competitor I, or as a rival. One can see students seeing themselves as rivals for, in competing for scarce resources. One can see universities and departments themselves as engaging in a competitive process. So the self-interpretations and the practices and the behavior together coalesce around a stable pattern, let's say. And this, an aspect of that pattern, one can name as a social logic of competition. And one can do exactly the same thing with a set of other social logics. As you can imagine, social logics of instrumentalization, atomization, hierarchy, these are all, in a way, trying to capture something about the patterns within a practice or a regime of practices. Political logics, on the other hand, are trying to capture something about, for example, how those specific patterns, the social logics or the norms, have come into existence in the first place. So the political logics are trying to capture something about the diachronic movement. They are organizationally grounded rhetorical tropes that seek to draw equivalences or differences between elements, groups or individuals, typically by appealing to an existing social norm or to an alternative projected norm. So, we can have a particular vision of the university as equivalent to a business, as opposed to a site for blue sky thinking or the production of critical citizens. And this generates, obviously, a set of equivalences, potentially a set of equivalences that can be drawn in to contest or to promote, in this case, the institution of particular social logics, say, the social logic of competition. The logics of mobilization understood in relation to, are understood in relation to the political dimension. And this is actually a quite a crucial, uh, I think, aspect. And it's crucial, I think, in perhaps drawing some of the links to the Populismus uh, project eventually. But actually, if one thinks about it, one has to have a fairly clear sense of what norms, social norms, are in existence, the way that we characterize them, and then potentially are problematic, in order to identify how a set of political logics come to contest it, or indeed the opposite, prevent it from being contested. I'm going to say something. It's, it's, uh, uh, Chantal Mouffe also has a claim here uh, about the potential 
contestability as being absolutely central in trying to capture what's at stake in this political dimension. And what's, what's, what's interesting there is that is, is the potential for contestation that's central to drawing out the political dimension. And what that means is that one can still speak about political logics even in the absence of contestation. And I think that's absolutely crucial in being able to identify movements, political logics, whose role is to preempt, to prevent the contestation of certain norms. And again, there, the actual work that is required in identifying norms that we think are worthy of contestation is absolutely central. So in addition to the social and political logics, and, and this is a key part of what I was saying earlier on, uh, that the, this approach is trying to uh, draw on and trying to uh, uh, operationalize and make relevant is the centrality of affect in thinking about political discourse and social discourse more generally. And uh, so obviously drawing on, again on work that is associated with the Essex School, of course Yanis's work uh, is, is central in this. Uh, and so the idea of a phantasmatic logic, which pertains to the ideological dimension, are, you could say, linked to de desire-based narratives uh, and in which ideals play an important role, obstacles play an important role. Um, in some respects, you've got uh, elements that resist public official disclosure. It provides means of enjoyment. This is more the effective uh, dimension. And ultimately serves a particular uh, function, which is to give us a sense of protection, let's say from anxiety. It offers us different ways of thinking about it. There, there are beatific, let's say, uh, uh, dimensions to fantasy. There are horrific aspects uh, to fantasy. But here you may be familiar with certain portrayals of students and lecturers as lazy, as students as certainly as self-centered, lectures that are corrupting the youth, which was absolutely central in, in, in engaging a set of reforms in the Thatcher era in moving from a certain conception of the university to one which is built very much uh, around the model of the, the business model, let's say, of the university. And these narratives, which uh, appear most prominently in the domain we could say uh, is characterized by the margins of official political discourse. So we're talking about novels, we're talking about TV programs, we're talking about wider cultural theory. These are absolutely central in developing and in creating an, an, in an affective landscape which makes certain reforms plausible. So these, these, this, this idea of a phantasmatic logic is trying to operationalize and make central the role of affect uh, and desire in thinking about uh, social and political uh, practices. It tries to capture something about the grip of norms, why it is that certain norms, for example, appear to be, to, 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 to appear very difficult to budge, very difficult to dislodge, or on the contrary, why some norms appear to be quite easily transformed. So the idea of fantasy here is trying to give us a certain energy, let's say, to these social norms, but also a certain energy to the political mobilization to transform or to defend a set of uh, norms. Let's see. What time, what time did I start? Uh, yes, yeah, so that, 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 uh, that circle there is um, what I wanted to highlight, and perhaps we can come back to that uh, a, a bit later, because I think that it's uh, quite helpful in thinking about the role to, to draw out some of the implications for thinking about populism, uh, uh, the role of the um, political dimension. So, back to this financial crisis. So basically what I try to do is it's a very rapid overview of uh, the basic elements of the uh, logics approach, and I'm happy to come back to that later. Uh, but what I want to do now is link it back to the problem here of the UK financial crisis. So we ended up with this question of why and how we fail to talk or respond differently to the crisis and this need for a cognitive map. And we've gone through the logics, and now what um, the Irvin Goffman text, some people may be familiar with that, 
cooling the marks out, some aspects of adaptation to failure, is uh, uh, quite an astute and uh, very um, uh, interesting text which tries to uncover how the, 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 the social psychology, let's say, of how we cope with disappointment, uh, centered around our reactions to being taken in through um, uh, uh, some illegal activities, like uh, some illegal gambling activities, and how we get caught up with it, and how we cope with certain losses associated with it. And there are certain key concepts associated with that. <clears throat> um, marks, venture, accident, squawking, and cooling. And so I'm just going to say something briefly about each of these, uh, because I think that will contextualize uh, the table that I want to put up afterwards. So what is the mark? These, are, by the way, are quotes from Irvin Goffman now. In the argo of the criminal world, the term mark refers to any individual who is a victim or prospective victim of certain forms of planned illegal exploitation. The mark is the sucker, the person who's taken in. The potential sucker is given an opportunity to invest his money in a gambling venture, which he understands to have been fixed in his favor. The venture, of course, is fixed, but not in his favor. The mark is permitted to win some money and then persuaded to invest more. There is then an accident or a mistake, and the mark loses his total investment. The operators then depart in a ceremony that is called the blow-off or sting. They leave the mark, but take his money. The mark is expected to go on his way a little wiser and a lot poorer. Sometimes, however, a mark is not quite prepared to accept his loss as a gain in experience and to say and do nothing about his venture. He may feel moved to complain to the police or to chase after the operators. In the terminology of the trade, the mark may squawk. From the operator's point of view, this kind of behavior is bad for business. In order to avoid this adverse publicity, an additional phase is sometimes added at the end of the play. It's called cooling the mark out. After the blow-off has occurred, one of the operators stays with the mark and makes an effort to keep the anger of the mark within manageable and sensible proportions. The operator stays behind his teammates in the capacity of what might be called a cooler and exercises upon the mark the art of consolation. An attempt is made to define the situation for the mark in a way that makes it easy for him to accept the inevitable and quietly go home. The mark is given instruction in the philosophy of taking a loss. So, what, we're, what we try to do is use that as a kind of a narrative device, let's say, in situating this broader narrative of the institution of a set of social logics associated with the finance regime within the context of the UK. So we have here, as you see, the venture phase, which is, coincides with this period, again, in the Thatcher era, when you have the institution of a set of policies affecting, targeting specifically the banking sector and the finance sector, well, about 20 years or so from the 80s 1980s to 2007, after which you have the accident and the blow-off. We have a squawking phase, and we have the cooling phase. And so I use those terms as a kind of a framing device to situate these particular logics. So these social logics associated with the regime, the finance regime, uh, the banking regime, the finance regime in general. What are these? Again, this is a part of the illustration here. So one can imagine naming these social logics, these particular norms, as ones of deregulation. A whole range of different, a, a whole range of different scopes, degrees. One can think of norms of shareholder value and competition in thinking about the structuring in the finance uh, realm. We can also think about these norms as speculative leverage and risk dispersal. Here, the uh, 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 speculative leverage is, is uh, 
I think, fairly straightforward, and you can sort of get the general uh, gist, uh, where you, you take out a loan and you leverage that to purchase uh, um, um, bigger items. Risk dispersal and displacement is also uh, fairly, I think, recognizable. Certainly recognizable in terms of the uh, uh, CDOs, CDSs, and so on and so forth, these very technical uh, instruments in finance, which were designed specifically to disperse risk and also to displace risk in a, in a range of different ways, to displace and disperse risk among investors, between investors, between investors and the taxpayer, and so on. And that this uh, period, or these logics in a sense, uh, experience a period of expansion and sedimentation over, this, uh, over these uh, decades. And in that context, one can think here of these particular norms and these particular social logics as being instituted as such. They're coming into existence. And they come into existence, is going back to the diachronic dimension that I mentioned earlier on, is, is the, through a set of political logics. So these political logics are deployed. Certainly, there are certain rhetorical tropes, but also allied with a, a set of mobilizations, institutional mobilizations, and wider other mobilizations, whose aim really is to institute these norms. One example, we can say this idea of technologics. Uh, so what are these technologics? One can imagine what they might mean, but certainly there's an element of expertise uh, that is required, uh, technique, technical expertise, and certain technical uh, terminology that's at stake in instituting these norms. Because the idea is that you need to be experts in the field to understand the complicated nature of these instruments. There's a technique, there's technical expertise that is required. But it's not just about these uh, complicated instruments. There's also something much more specific about the computerized stochastic processes uh, in measuring and thinking about risk. Again, appealing to this idea of expertise. So these. What do they do? These, these are political logics precisely in the sense that they facilitate the institution of a set of norms. Now, many people who are familiar with the British uh, uh, case will be familiar with this very prominent, uh, phantasmatic headline uh, no more going back to uh, boom and bust. Um, uttered many times by uh, Gordon Brown. There's no going back to this boom and bust oscillation. Um, uh, but what you find is actually that there is something much more at stake there. So it's not just about no more boom and bust. It's about only boom. It's no bust, only boom. That's the kind of the headline between the lines element, I think, which is at stake. And this is absolutely palpable, both in the context of the media, but also in the context of everyday practices, this idea of getting something for nothing. It sounds odd, but it was, it's, it's very much a, a staple of uh, a whole range of productions cultural productions and media productions. And one of the most prominent ones is uh, these uh, programs on property prices and the en endless rising property prices, how we can think about. So you'd be foolish not to take out a loan when you can exercise the leverage you can do. So there's this idea that you can take advantage of these um, times. You can get something for nothing, and you're a fool if you don't. So this idea of only boom and not bust was absolutely central in giving a certain energy, let's say, effective energy in the institution process of a set of norms, but also in exercising, you're thinking about what exercises the grip of a set of norms. These uh, uh, social norms, social logics of deregulation, shareholder value competition, which enable us to have this uh, amazing and un endless growth. And then we have, we have the, the, the accident and the blowout. And what's interesting there is that immediately we have um, <clears throat> this uh, 
figure who uh, who becomes very prominent. You know, the sort of the uh, the figure of the banker um, who has spoiled the party. That emerges in a very very dramatic way and and serves as the focus of endless uh, debate and blame. And uh, uh, what's interesting is that that is accompanied. So it, it, it's the, the, the kind of enjoyment that that produces. Uh, and I think here you can see here, the fat cat Lloyd's TSB bankers gorge themselves on a sumptuous five course feast paid by you. There's an element here of enjoyment that is excessive, that is played on within the context of the media. But it's not just this idea of enjoyment that is excess, excessive, but it's also enjoyment which is enjoyed at your expense. And that's an, a, a key part of the, the idea, the Lacanian idea of the theft of enjoyment, which is a central part. So afterwards, they retired to the swanky, the swanky hotel bar and roared with laughter. So there's a kind of enjoyment, an excessive enjoyment, and that that enjoyment is at our expense. And this is a very palpable, uh, and, and, and it's a, kind of a narrative and a, and, a, and a vignette that gets iterated and reiterated uh, endlessly uh, across the... Uh, so he's got, here we've got... We got uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, Fred the Shred Goodwin, uh, the head of the RBS, who is uh, wanted. And so it's certainly a target. But what's interesting is that this affective energy, this enjoyment, is accompanied by a set of other political logics. And uh, we can think of these operating in the mode, whoops, uh, I, I'm jumping ahead here, sorry. Uh, these, uh, these, we can think of these as operating in the mode of preemptive, the preemptive mode. So these political logics, it's going back to that earlier point, which I highlighted as absolutely central, is that we have a set of um, social logics which are now, and norms, that are in need of defense and in need of protection. So what's happening, you could say, is that you have a set of political logics, let's call them logics of responsabilization, which was a very uh, prominent uh, political logic being deployed at the time, which said that, yes, we have uh, bad bankers, but we also have good bankers. So we can draw a, a we can make a difference here. So there's logics of difference operative here. So we can make a distinction within the category of the bankers between those who are good and those who are not good. It means that we can also make a set of distinctions between those consumers who are responsible and those consumers who are irresponsible, namely those consumers who went out and took their loans without having enough uh, collateral and so on. So we have these two, this logics, so the logics of responsabilization and individualization become, we can, we can qualify this as a political logic in a very precise sense we characterize as a political logic because they preempt the contestation of a norm that we perhaps feel is worth contesting that is not being contested. So these norms, let's say, of neo neoliberal finance. So the identification, what I'm trying to get at here, and this is the central point that we come, come back to, is, is the, almost the, 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 the crucial uh, uh, task of identifying norms as potentially contestable, and that are perhaps worthy of contestation, in order to get the analytical and research task off the ground to be able to qualify a logic as a political logic in the first place. <clears throat> um, so, again, here trying to follow the, the kind of the, the, the narrative device from uh, uh, Goffman here, uh, <coughs> we have this cooling phase. Um, and uh, certainly, there are these calls for a return to the golden age of responsibility and responsible capitalism, uh, drawing a contrast with reckless uh, capitalism. But what's also interesting here is this um, attempt to restore some sense of this enjoyment, this loss of enjoyment, this lost uh, mode of uh, being, let's say, accompanying that with... Um, a set of, again, crucial political logics, which in this case you could say operate in the mode of restoration. 
So on the one hand, we can qualify political logics as preemptive, they preempt the contestation of certain norms, but we can also characterize them as restorative. So there's a much more, let's say, aggressive now deployment of a set of political logics whose aim is not simply to preempt the contestation of a set of norms, but to reinforce their institution. And one key uh, restorative device is this United Kingdom Financial Investment, UKFI, which was set up uh, very early on in uh, 2008 in the wake of the bailout. So this accident is, uh, coincides with the bailout, and we have uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the national government bailing out um, uh, the, uh, a set of banks, and this, the United Kingdom Financial Investment Organization was set up, as it says here, uh, with the clear mandate of managing the government's investments in financial institutions to protect and create value for the taxpayer as shareholders at arm's length from the government. And of course, the UKFI was set up, and main, the, the, the vast majority of the members in the UKFI are ex, or, uh, uh, finance uh, um, uh, uh, experts, been working in the city and so on. Um, and we have this uh, uh, statement from Gordon Brown, if you are a saver in setting up the UKFI, if you're a saver, uh, if you're a homeowner, an entrepreneur, a family struggling to get by, I want you to know that we are doing this for you. And you could see here a certain set of objectives associated with the setting up of the UKFI. Restoration of failed banks, certainly. The return to prudence. Promise of financial gain to the taxpayer and preserving key features of the financial, of finance capitalism. And that's the key f aspect, you know, the preser preservation of a set of norms in finance capitalism. <clears throat> and so we can characterize, so what is this restorative political logic, we can name it, we can name this political logic as a shareholder-citizen logic, let's say. Because, why? Because now we cannot see ourselves, we, I mean, we who have bailed out the banks, we, the taxpayer, cannot see ourselves other than as investors. So, it's, a, it's a, another device, let's say, of trying to restore and reinstitute in a very clear fashion a set of norms that we began by saying may be problematic. So this idea of the political logics, political logics uh, operating in the preemptive and restorative fashion. Uh, what are we doing here? Okay. okay. Um, what I would like to do now is uh, present. Uh, uh, no, okay. This is a, we can talk about the Goffman um, a narrative device, and I think it's, it, it, it. I think it can be um, made a bit more nuanced, let's say. But uh, this first overview presents us with a set of problems, a, a set of issues, where at least presented us with a set of issues in terms of how we go about engaging in a critical uh, empirical research. So what was the starting point? The starting point was this apparent reluctance within established UK policy formation processes to take seriously a future beyond neoliberal finance in the wake of the crisis. So there's most consensus about that. Policy formation processes and elite and mass discourses on the crisis aim at restoration of the status quo rather than reassessment of our priorities. That was the starting uh, question. However, it's worth pointing out that what's at stake here is not a failure of imagination. What we have here, more than anything else, it's, it's not that we, have, um, we don't have alternatives. Uh, we have a failure of alternative economic imaginaries to enter established policy formation processes and mainstream media commentaries. That's what's at stake. So what gets lost from view in this analysis that I've presented so far is a certain dynamic. The dynamics of the hegemonic struggle, of a hegemonic struggle. So what, what's interesting, in, certainly within the UK context, is that you have numerous bodies, organizations, uh, uh, intellectuals, and so on and so forth, who have come out with a wide array of alternative visions in thinking about how one should, how one should structure the, the banking sector, the finance sector, and so on and so forth. 
what's interesting and what becomes the problem then is how is it that given this proliferation, it really is you know, quite a proliferation of uh, alternative visions that are out there. How is it that that uh, does not enter the uh, policy, the official, let's say, policy making circles? So that becomes a slightly different, slightly differently inflected kind of question. So this is a movement in, in the problematization process that I mentioned earlier, earlier on. So the issue might be how, how can we characterize, how can we explain and evaluate this narrowing of the debate in and around uh, the reform process. And there are two things that come up there. Um, one is what, I, what exactly are these alternative economic imaginaries? And in, 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 in trying to address this particular question, I'm going to refer to this, what I called earlier on, the nodal framework. And I want to, I want to sort of uh, briefly sketch that out. I know we probably won't have time to go through it in need, but at least, at least I can put up a, a diagram and then we can talk about it if you want. Um, because what we found in, in presenting this first overview from the venture phase all the way to the cooling phase is that even though this is this analysis is conducted, this is a critical analysis of what's going on. Um, what happened is that, that, that uh, even, it, it, they, they're involved a kind of reinforcement of the operating norms and social logics in the ne neoliberal finance domain, even though it was under the guise, in a negative guise, even though it was under the guise of critique. So it's a, a critique, but it's amplifying and reinforcing these logics, these norms, by dint of repetition. So the question for us was, well, is there a way, as academics, let's say, who are engaged in this process and who are writing about this, to enable these alternative visions to gain some exposure? <laughs> even in terms of you know, uh, actually writing about it. So this is, what, this is what was driving this idea of starting from the other side, starting, in other words, from the margins and moving to the center. So the idea here was to look at these two, um, to, to, to ask the question, is it how and why these particular, following these particular alternative visions or imaginaries become marginalized. And so we, uh, uh, the idea here is to look at something much more specific, a set of documents associated with the Independent Commission on Banking, uh, the so-called Vickers Report, uh, that uh, uh, resulted in the finance, Financial Services Banking Reform Bill of 2012 and 2013. So the Vickers, the Vickers uh, uh, project uh, emerged uh, 2011, and it was a long haul inviting a uh, long haul process inviting a lot of, uh, and consult, uh, consulting lots of uh, stakeholders with the idea of proposing reforms. So a set of documents were associated with this Vickers uh, report. It's interim reporting and it's final reporting and everything that happened in between. Uh, of course, there were many other documents and many other uh, uh, reports that came out before that, but in terms of focusing this particular um, project, it was focused around the ICB. But in addition, to look at this process, and this is the key, let's say, research strategic uh, dimension of this analysis, is to look at this process from the perspective of the margins. So we take a particular um, uh, um, uh, well, in this case, it was two left-leaning think tanks, the New Economics Foundation, some people may be familiar with, and Compass. So we said, well, okay, here we have uh, a set of think tanks, left-leaning think tanks, okay, who have very specific, who have elaborated very specific alternative visions. And so the, our question was, well, what happens in practice? You know, we're trying to get at the dynamics of the struggle. So what happens when you have these ideas, you develop them, you have certain sources, and you try to expose them, you try to give them some air. So the idea would be to try and monitor the process by which these attempts are being made from the margins to present certain ideas and to explore the dynamics of the process by which they become marginalized. 
in order to give that um, greater specificity, um, uh, we're um, developing this, 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 what we call a kind of a nodal framework. And why is that important? It's important because it gives us a focus in thinking about how we analyze the text themselves. So we're looking at the ICB, and we're looking at the productions over this period, 2010 to 2000, roughly 2012, of uh, NEF and uh, Compass. So they have a series of documents, uh, quite a large corpus. But what was important really is to enable us to focus this reading and the interpretive process. So the idea was to take out, to, to look at these documents from the point of view of these nodes. So we have these nodes of provision, nodes of distribution, nodes of delivery, and nodes of governance. It's very simple, but uh, it draws on a set of literature um, in and around co-production in public services, but I think it's generalizable in this case. So the node of provision is really trying to describe a set of social logics, that lo social logics of appearance. How is it, in this case banking, appears on the scene in the first place? Certain backing services, how do they appear? How, how are these services provided? And certainly one, has, one uh, way of thinking about that is in terms of market competition. Serves as the key device of producing certain uh, 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 banking services. But obviously there are many different ways of thinking about um, the production of uh, the banking, um, banking services. Uh, I've mentioned market competition and the colors represent simply um, names, uh, well, those, the, the, the color, sorry, what, the red color represents um, norms that can be discerned in the documents of the ICB, and the green color names represent the norms that one can discern in the think tank documentation. So the idea was to go through these documents using the prism of the nodes. So we think, okay, what do these documents have to say from the point of view of provision? What do these documents have to say from the point of distribution? So distribution is simply about how banking services, once they have emerged in the first place, how are they distributed to users? Certainly advertising is a key aspect, but you may have issues having to do with access. How are they accessed? Nodes of delivery, on the other hand, are trying to capture those norms or social logics, let's say, with the actual delivery of the service itself. So having to do with certain technologies, how the professional banker interacts with the user, what models, ideals are uh, uh, operative in thinking about the relationship between the banking professional and the user, and so on. So you can look at each of these documents from the point of view of these nodes. And the idea is to come up with the characterization of these social logics in order to understand then the process of marginalization. So how is it, and what I want to do now is just bring back, I've, been, I've spent a bit of time sort of sketching out this nodal framework whose aim really is to fine tune the process of characterization, how one can come up with a set of social norms or a set of social logics, and to bring back this logics framework. Because it means that we have a set of um, documents that generate alternative visions. So on the one hand, we have the current regime, Right, the current regime we're operating with. So we've got, in the wake of a crisis, we have the setting up of the Vickers Commission, the ICB, which, in a sense, offers a certain problematization of the current regime, simultaneously adding its own projected vision of how it sees or how it would like to see the finance regime reformed. So it's an alternative vision. Similarly, Compass and NEF 
present us with another set of documents, which can be analyzed again through this nodal framework, that offer us a different set of projected social norms. And the point is that actually, some of these, will sh they will share, ICB and the Compass and NEF will share certain norms, and some will be, be different. However, the question is, how is it and why do certain alternative norms which are being offered by Compass and NEF, how do they not, why is it that they do not make it into the official policy-making circles? And so that sets up the dynamic, this threefold um, uh, uh, a triangular relationship sets out a certain dynamic in which a set of political logics and a set of phantasmatic logics are deployed that enable a process of marginalization to take place. What's central, I think, is in a way, this, this idea that I've, I've, I've kept on harping on, and we can come back to this, is the idea of the political logic. The qualification of, as a, logic, of, of a logic as political requires, in a sense, an identification, an uncertain understanding of the, the norms that govern the regime in the first place, and that ought, which norms ought to, perhaps, be seen as contestable or problematic. Uh, now, how are we doing? I mean, I'm happy to... Uh, yeah, I could, I could conclude. Um, I don't... I, I, uh, uh, okay, so what, 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 what I, I can just finish by simply saying how um, one can link it to uh, uh, this, this, this particular way of marginalizing. So this master, this master signifier that emerged in the context of the reform process uh, was this signifier called stable competition. So stable competition became a key reference point in thinking about the reform process. This is what the debate revolved around. So we have the, narrow, the narrowing, the characterization of this debate in these narrow terms, which is about the compatibility of the aims of regulation. In other words, how do we ensure stability? and the effects of regulation. This is a loss, the potential loss of, global, of the global competitive age, edge. <clears throat> so what happens is that a, a central part of the debate revolves around how we make competition stable through regulation. So regulation becomes a key flashpoint in thinking about the debate. This is the characterization of this debate in, that, in those terms. So this idea of stable competition becomes absolutely central. So to return to the question, how to characterize, how to explain, how to evaluate this narrowing of the debate involves stipulating a hypothesis of sorts, which is that this imperative for regulation to ensure stable competition serves as a master signifier that organizes a set of political logics that effectively marginalize more radical critiques in the provision, distribution, delivery, and governance of banking services. So we have this idea now, one can flesh out, of critique. So the critical dimension of this analysis revolves around an intranodal and internodal marginalization process. So it has to do with how within the node of um, governance, the issue of regulation becomes paramount. Within the node of governance, the debate revolves around regulation. We have to regulate to ensure stable competition, long-term stable competition. But within this node of governance, it's also possible to debate other sets of issues. It's also possible to debate what the scope of stakeholders should be in governance. What's the scope of transparency in thinking about governance? These get talked about briefly, 
But overwhelmingly, what's at stake here is the, the role of regulation within the node of governance. So there is intra-nodal marginalization. So these other issues about governance don't get much air. But there's also inter-nodal marginalization, which means that there is a set of other issues connected to the nodes of provision, the nodes of distribution, and the nodes of delivery that also do not get debated. So this is the other side of the marginalization process, again, emphasizing the critical dimension here. So what often does not get talked about is, for example, around the node of provision, the internal organization of finance organizations or banking organizations. See, the internal organization is, well, who appropriates the surplus within a banking organization? How is this distribution of the surplus within the organization organized? These were not, these are not, these are not, these are not simply, just simply, they are not talked about. So there is, there is this attempt, what I'm trying to capture here is how the logics approach can be grafted onto what we're calling here a nodal framework in order to highlight the critical dimension of the analysis using a post-structuralist background ontology. Thanks.